Greetings and welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am a bass player and songwriter from the Gem City, Dayton, Ohio. Oh, it's a special one today. Continuing the series of discussions, very nerdy and deep discussions about Fountains of Wayne albums. Today we're moving on to the second one, which is called Utopia Parkway. That's right, today on... The You Could Be My Aramis podcast, a deep, deep dive into Utopia Parkway. Here to help me break down this album are Marissa Bucks Bucksbaum. Hopefully you heard the quotation marks in the middle part there. And Brandon Similar. Let's get to it. I have with me Marissa Bucksbaum, who has another last name also, but we'll call her Marissa and or Bucks. And Brandon Similar. Now, the cool thing is both of you have been on this podcast before. Absolutely. But not with, e- not with each other. No. And for different records, presumably. Yeah. Uh, so we're here to talk about Utopia Parkway. This is the second in my Let's Be Nerdy fan people of Fountains of Wayne series. And <laughs> what am I holding in my hands? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, that looks like a CD that was purchased in the 90s. <laughs> it was. <laughs> How did you I guess? Can, it's I a, can just the case it. Yeah. And it's a famous thoroughfare in Queens, or at least it's famous to me. Now, I like that comment because I did not know this was a real place until way after I bought this record. I thought it was like, you know, album art. It's a real place. Yeah. Marissa, Absolutely. have you driven on Utopia Parkway? I have not driven on Utopia Parkway. As a native New Yorker, you could not pay me to drive in New York. <laughs> That's fair. That's entirely fair. Yeah. Yeah, the times I have gone, I would not want to drive either. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're here to talk about the second of uh, the second album in Fountains of Wayne's illustrious career. I also really like the art they put on the physical disc. And I will tell you that I bought this within a week of it being released. So... I'm dating myself, obviously. I'm an old. I apologize for all you young people out there who No, you them. are you are young and sprightly, Mike. Ah, that's, you're you're so kind. But uh <laughs> yeah, like the that's good. I like uh, there's actual art on the CD. Now this is not a video podcast, but the, the disc actually has some some brick, which is probably a real building, and then the words Utopia Parkway on it, which is probably yeah. um a real street sign, come to think of it. That's a cool yeah, that's a really cool image on the C D there. So, Brandon, you were going to tell this story before I hit the record button, and I told you, no, save it for the recording. So now we can bask in the glory of how you got to know about this band and this album. Yeah, so um, as you all know, I'm, I'm, or, or as you know, Mike, and, uh, and you are about to uh, find out, Marissa, I'm, I, so I was born in 91, so I was, I was a little young when the when Fountains of Wayne was starting to do their thing, right? I remember being, um, let's see, I guess I would have been about 12 when they had their uh, colossal, the hit that shall not be named. Um, So, and that was at that time, my first exposure to them. And, you know, I generally knew them for that song. Um, So then I I start to do more in music, obviously, uh, in my twenties and, uh, of course, in 2020, tragically, Adam Schlesinger passes. And uh, I knew that he was, this is one of those things, it's just how you get to know people in art where you hear something somewhere, then you hear something else. It's like, oh, the guy from Thousands of Wayne also wrote for film and television. Oh, he wrote, um, what's the show he wrote on? Is it My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I know he, he wrote on that. Oh, he wrote, uh, that thing you do, the main track there. So I have a big respect for people who are just songwriters in the industry. And so when he passed, I was like, oh, Fountains of Wayne, Adam Schlesinger, obviously it's tragic. It was a, it was a sad moment, but I said, I need to dig into Fountains of Wayne more because I had also heard these from different perspectives that actually Fountains of Wayne, don't overlook them. Like they have an incredible discography. And then it started like in 2020, I'm in lockdown, just like binge listening to Fountains of Wayne. And um, 
So I would, you two have been fans for a longer amount of time, I would assume. Mine is more of a short and concentrated dose, but I am very much uh, obsessed to a degree with this band and a huge fan of their work. It's influenced a lot of what I've done lately. And I just have such a huge respect uh, for them and I'm, and I'm such a fan. So that's where I'm coming from. Bless you. And uh, and Bucks, you, you told your Fountain to Wayne story on the previous episode. You also discovered them through the song that we shall not name on this episode. How did you mm-hmm. manage to find out about Utopia Parkway? Um, Utopia Parkway is actually probably the Fountains of Wayne album that I revisit the least frequently. But um, even it, least even less frequently than Fountains uh, than uh, Traffic and Weather. Yes, ironically enough, um, I listen listen to traffic and weather quite a bit and out of state plates and uh, welcome interstate managers and uh, the, the the first album, which you and I discussed at length uh, in the in the first portion of this series. But Utopia Parkway was sort of the, the last Fountains of Wayne album to really grow on me. And I'm not sure why that is my it, it my memory of it, like like I can't place it as far as how I came into it and got into it the way that I can welcome interstate managers, but it has solidified itself in my own personal ranking of the records. It to me is transitional because you have, there's more of a gloss to it that you can hear than is on the first album. And it's also got elements in it of that kind of dark humor that to me they really perfected with Welcome Interstate Managers and not just the humorous element but just the 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 darkness to it there's sort of a the, the Utopia Parkway to me is like the tri-state Napoleon Dynamite uh Fountains of Wayne album and Welcome Interstate Managers goes a little more office space slash like a little a dash here and there of like Glen Gary Glen Ross. So for me it's it's that that is the perfect platonic ideal Fountains of Wayne album, but Utopia Parkway is when I feel like they became the most recognizable as a band to me for all those stylistic traits and thematic and songwriting hallmarks that make me love them. I'm going to start with how I found this record. I was already a fan. I had their first record. I saw them on tour in 97, which we covered in our previous episode. And basically, as soon as this dropped, I went out and got it. As an old dude who's who's loved this band for a long time, I have a hard time deciding, and most people don't have this problem. There are times I think this is a better record than Welcome Interstate Managers. And I know that's the most popular and most famous of their records, and people love it top to bottom. And I think that this album is just as flawless. It's a little different, right? Uh, good point, Marissa, about it sounding more polished. Obviously, they had more label money on hand than they did on their first record, and they took more time with the songwriting. And they had Jody Porter, who is... And yeah. they had Jody That's Porter, big who yeah. was not yeah. in the band the first record, right? They recorded oh that record, gosh. then they went out and got a band. So, as a good point, you say that there's actually guitar solos here that are complex and interesting in guitarist it's probably not a word um and no it's a word it's right, a word cool yeah. and that's jody yeah, porter yeah. saying here i'm in the band now haha ha, right oh uh, gosh that guy um go hippie is that the one that's got the super long the guitar solo, in it? Guitar solo. Yeah, yeah, the like wah, the wah, yeah, wah. it's like welcome yeah. to the band jody porter right um oh it's cool yeah I, there are times when I think I like this record better than Welcome Interstate Managers. There are times. Um, but yeah, the first one's always going to be my favorite. But I like what you said, Bucks, about the darkness. Because Chris Collingwood has said specifically in interviews, they, he thought that some of the songs on the first record came off too campy. So he intentionally tried to write more serious subject material on this record. So on Utopia Parkway, when you hear a song that is depressing, I'm looking at you... Hat and Feet, Troubled Times, Fine Day for a Parade, right? Those are the Chris Collingwood songs, and he's trying to be serious. I feel like Hat and Feet is so ludicrously, like, indulgently funny. It's It's hilarious. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) I I honestly thought that was Adam Schlesinger. I I don't know who it is. I will be completely forthcoming with you. 
unlike Welcome Interstate Managers or the self-titled first album, I have no idea who wrote what except for Red Dragon Tattoo because there's a lyric in there that's I don't know from Maritime and I don't know from is very specifically a Yiddish yeah. uh, grammatical construction or, or syntactic construction. So I know that's Adam Schlesinger because they're You're like the Jewish person wrote that one. That. <laughs> <laughs> but everything else is sort of a mystery to me. Hat and feet is like so silly. It's it's an autobiographical obituary from for like a Looney Tunes character. Now, exactly. Yeah. I thought yeah. because it was sad, it was a Chris song, but I could be wrong. But I was we were driving around with my wife listening to this, and I'm like, hey, Misty, you know this song's about somebody that got killed by something falling out of a window, right? It's so depressing if you actually pay attention. It's also if you... sorry because don't worry, it, it's it's um you can't tell if it's funny or depressing. Yeah, I feel like it, it's like the first verse, you're kind of wondering what's going on here. They get to the chorus. Then the second verse, I think if you don't know that it's a story based on someone actually dying, you really think they're talking about a cart like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah, like why, literally yeah. someone being splatted on the street or like a Tom and Jerry or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's what I picture when I listen to the song. And it, I actually think it's funny, but th that, this gets back to like in music, just how having prior knowledge of something can kind of change the flavor of a song, right? But um, I always thought it's kind of a deeply amusing song about a like temporarily uh, dead cartoon character. <laughs> well, that means that we have to decide it's an Adam song. And uh, if, 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 if Chris ever hears this, you could feel free to correct us. But that lyric about taking a powder, that's such a Schlesinger sounding lyric. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Even though Chris has said that he tried to write the serious ones on this. So now, since we're talking about songs, now it's time for the question. What's your favorite song on this record? And I, I feel like ladies first, always. Lady. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I am going to have to go with, and I'm like, I'm actually bringing it up on my phone to make sure I'm not um, missing. <laughs> and and uh, thank you, Mike, for, for showing me the, the back of the record. Uh, I'm going to go with... It must be summer. It's it's pure. I'm looking through you, rubber soul Beatles, from the opening to the you know, the the just the rhythm of the chorus. Uh, everything about it is what I grew up with and what registers to me as comforting and familiar. But of course, it's also got that wonderful Fountains of Wayne contrast where this gorgeous melody and beautiful harmonies are being used to convey this complete disaffection. You've got a beautiful summer's day um, and this guy can't get through to the woman he desperately wants to talk to, doesn't want to hang around on the beach, doesn't want to enjoy the sunshine. It's, it's that misery of, you know, you're supposed to be happy and enjoying yourself and ever, and you see everyone around you enjoying themselves but you can't be a part of it because in your head you're stewing over lost love or a missed opportunity. It's, it's just classic fountains of Wayne, beautiful power pop packaging. And the core sentiment is a little dark and screwed up. Two thoughts. This is one of a million songs that doesn't work once the cell phones are invented in common. <laughs> yes, there, there's so there actually there's so many Fountains of Wayne songs now that I think about it that make reference to technology that's out of date. Yeah, I mean, because uh, they're real, right? Yeah. Uh, number two, I feel like this is someone's going to break your heart, but really early. Yeah, I feel like you can get a lot of uh, the prequels of Look Park from really all of Fountains of Wayne, where you, you'll yes. hear a song that's just, just a little different than their usual vibe. And you've got Collingwood kind of going on these like literary sort of tangents and you go, okay, this is, this is Book Park. I think the biggest example to me is, um, and this is right before it, but is someone's going to break your heart off, uh, off their last record. That is my favorite record that is now skipping my, what is it called? <laughs> 
Yeah, sky full of holes, I think is. is sky full of holes. Yeah. Yeah, I literally just, yeah, that's my, actually my favorite record by them, if I had to pick one, which I know is a, probably a weird take, but. Um, we'll get to yeah. that when we get to that record. <laughs> but I just, my main point being, yes, Collingwood, you can hear kind of sprinkles of who he would become throughout throughout their material. And I guess in to that end, you can stir the the first uh, sprouts from the seed of tension that was between Schlesinger and Collingwood over the sort of mood and soul of the band. And, um, you know, I, 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 I understand, I guess, where Collingwood was coming from. But to me, even Schlesinger's humor, there's something about it that's that's deeply um, tender and and interested. You know, yeah. he, he's he's not creating these characters uh, as two dimensional caricatures to to mock. They they do feel like real people just with the, the the details that he's giving you none of it feels like he's looking down his nose at them or sneering at them they're they're funny and flawed because human beings are funny and flawed I agree that, completely. That's brilliant analysis which is to, why to be, i like to have bucks on my podcast <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> to be in the room for what those fights were about though would be so it's just like the it's like the beatles thing right which people finally got a glimpse of last year and they lost their minds um, <laughs> but uh, it'd be so interesting to see what, because we obviously know there was a lot of conflict, but kind of what it stemmed over, what it was on, and how much egos were coming to play, which I'm sure was a lot of it. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, one of the thought experiments I like to entertain or just, just, just to imagine is I know with the first album, they've mentioned that at that point, they were just kind of writing stuff to try and make the other laugh. Mm -hmm. I wonder what kind of album would have transpired if the two of them were like, well, I, I, I want to make the other guy cry. I, I want to do like the equivalent of, or, or, or something like, I, I'm going to try and make this person have an emotional response to an album that's akin to like watching The Sopranos or something. Would have been interesting. Yeah. Brandon Semler, your favorite song from Utopia Parkway. I'm going to be the big bummer here and i think we've literally already talked about this mike <laughs> just because these are the conversations we had when you were in austin was about fountains of wayne records and um but uh i'm gonna go find day for a parade um, definitely a chris song that one because it's miserable definitely. that one's brutal <laughs> it's brutal it, it's um i think it's sobering in a helpful way for the record uh the record is very peppy up to then and i love the peppiness don't get me wrong i mean lyrically red dragon tattoo is up there for me just in terms of well written like fun rock and roll songs um but fine day for a parade also just shows the i think some of the lyrical brilliance collingwood has and his kind of a, ability to while schlesinger i think is really good at telling stories i think collingwood's really good at painting pictures and uh, I think he really does that masterfully on Fine Day for a Parade. Yes, it is like the most downer song on the record for sure. I love their harmonies in that song too, where Schlesinger is actually singing the lower part. Um, it's got a really good contrast to kind of where their harmonies usually are in, in the scheme of things. I dig it. Also, an another song that's about a woman. Um, and, and this not, is Carver. Yeah, it, it, it's not... Um, about a woman in the way that say Maureen or Denise is about a woman in that it, it is, it is about desiring a woman. This is about inhabiting the subjectivity of a woman. And this is something that I touched on with the first album, something that fountains of Wayne does uncommonly well for yes. a group of guys in a guitar band. And particularly within the power pop genre, wherein the woman is the object very rarely the subject and here they're deliberately flipping that and they've done that at least once on every album so kudos to them as a as a female power pop fan and uh fountains of wayne fan yes I, I, sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say the vibe i get from it i think oftentimes i'll, I'll i can match a uh, sort of uh spiritual i don't know uh 
cousin or whatever by the Beatles with almost every Founds of Wayne song. And I think Eleanor Rigby would be the one for Fine Day for a Parade. Absolutely. Uh, it very much reminds me of that. Uh, yeah. I was going to say that sociopolitically, this one probably holds up better than anything else in the record. <laughs> sure. Because of how polarized this particular nation is. And not just this one, but if you travel a lot of places or, or the differences in, in how people feel about what's going on in the world uh, are very yeah. stark. But like, listen to these lyrics. It feels like this is something that you could hear today. Mrs. Carver says she's sorry. She knows enough to worry, but what does she know about crime? Believes the town is sinking the price of forward thinking. You stay up all night, half the time, a person that's very scared because of those, Dirty progressive liberals, right? Forward Absolutely. thinking, uh, and then she drinks. And she yeah. drinks in order to cope with the fear that she feels in her life, right? Uh, the second verse: Years ago, she lost her daughter off to a sacred order where they get stoned and work the earth, right? So, because of the things that she believes in, and her, because of her life, her family member has left her. So, this is a really depressing song, but it feels current, even though this came out in the '90s, which is crazy. And it's also to, you know, it, it would be very easy to take that character and be unsympathetic. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not. She, you know, it's you, not. She, she's human. And yep. they sing about her because, like, she's human and a real person. And you hear, you feel her feelings and her sadness and her fear. Absolutely. And I think you also just to speak a little bit about the melody and the interplay between their voices, their voices go in different directions lyrically in that chorus. And I think it adds to that tension of thought, right, that that fear, that kind of thought patterns just racing in and out that someone probably sitting alone at home with only their thoughts are going to experience. I just think everything in this song is is working to better it in some way it, down to the guitar solo what a cool disciplined little guitar section from joey porter um where he's he's i think he's doing some things with the volume knob it, it's this very just almost orchestral psychedelic thing and i i just love it and brandon i realize you're you're so right about the the visuals that collingwood is able to paint because it, it it's amazing just how quickly my mind goes to this you know little old woman sitting alone on a couch and it's dark and, and you just have the flickering of the television light, you know, illuminating her late at night. She's all alone. She's got a drink on the coffee table. It's, it's, it's so easy to envision right down to, you know, the furniture and the wallpaper and everything. And he, he's a really uh, a masterful um, lyricist in that regard. Yeah. My favorite song on this record, which is, man, it's hard to pick. There's like four of them that are tied. I got to say Troubled Times. And this song predates Fountains of Wayne. Chris apparently wrote it before they were in that band when he was in a previous band and brought it forward. And I hate to pick that one because it has a profanity in it. And in my personal music, I don't generally use profanity. I mean, I, not generally. I don't use profanity. Um, mm -hmm. I don't discourage. I mean, if that's part of your art, say what you want to say. But... Personally, for me, I don't generally like to curse, but there is a curse in the song. But the song is beautiful, and it expresses feelings that, like, it's kind of a end of relationship breakup song. And there's there's things there that are universal. And I mean, I'm going to take stuff from Brandon. There's beautiful harmonies. The melody's great. It's simple, but this is a band that does simple, but executes it perfectly. Yeah, it, it's among my favorite songs on the uh, on the record. I think it's interesting that it is the single, and I'm so interested in the process there too. Because I think of everything on the record, it is produced the most like you're trying to make a hit, get a hit in the late '90s. It's got a, that percussion at the beginning. It's very, it's very. It, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but produced kind of in this very staticky, almost like gated way that was kind of really big at the time. But the song itself, while there might be things about the production I'm not as wild about, the song itself, I think, is one of the best Collingwood's ever written. It's brilliant. The funny yeah. thing is the label didn't like this one, and I didn't yeah. even realize it was a single till way later because you never heard this on the radio. I mean, they would have had to clean it up for the radio anyway. Um, right. But I never heard this song on the radio. In fact, 
I'm holding the record. I didn't ever hear any of these songs on the radio. Yeah. The label was done with them by then, which is really a crying shame. Yeah, and then they weren't really. Uh, I was just reading some of the uh, the Wikipedia stuff earlier, but yeah, they they basically wouldn't promote it. They just they just let it die, um, which is which is really a shame. It's also such an interesting lead single for the record. I think I think it's definitely a single, but um, it's it's an interesting choice to lead a Fountains of Wayne record. Go, let's go sad. And right. And Mike, that says a lot about us that we picked the it really does. The, but look, the sad songs. We're songwriters, and like I always say, if you write songs, there's something deeply inherently wrong with you that you, <laughs> you write songs to get that out, right? So this is this is the songwriter's song. Well, this is maybe also yeah. prom theme and Senator's Daughter, but <laughs> these are like just deeply messed up songs that 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 talk about deep feelings, but it's it's beautiful, and I'm gl- I'm surprised it didn't make the first record because everything's ruined is pretty sad too. So there's room on that record for a song like this. Uh, sure. And again, this song was this is a song that predates there being Fountains of Wayne, but I'm glad it made this one, and it's it's at a perfect place in the record. It's right right after uh, the Valley of Malls, which sounds happy but isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's and, almost haunted, right? And right before "Go Hippie," so like it's a, it's the sequencing is great. Next question: What's your favorite lyric on the album? Bucks, ladies first. Oh gosh, um, probably just all of Denise. Honestly, there there there's so many little tidbits that illustrate who she is and what kind of woman she is. Uh, I heard she drives a lavender Lexus. Yeah, and she's got a heart made of gravel. Heart made like of gravel, that's such a good lyric. <laughs> uh, she listens to Puff Daddy. She, you know... P. Diddy. And he updates Actually, when, it later. Yeah, yeah when, they play, when they play live, they say P. Yeah. Diddy. It's so well, great. played, past tense. Um, yeah. d- to me, she is the, like, picture of the Jersey Shore. Um, even though her dad has moved to Texas or... Uh, is from there originally, I don't know. We have to sort of fill in the blanks ourselves, use our imagination to construct the the backstory for Denise. But there's just, there's so much there that I love. And I also, I have to go with um, Laser Show. They come from Hartford, Bridgeport, Derry. And I mean, my dad's from New Haven, Connecticut. And I spend probably as much time in Connecticut as I do in New York, in Westchester County. So just hearing that is great. And as someone who has also, you know, gotten messed up and gone to the Hayden Planetarium a, a time or two when I was a teenager, perhaps, perhaps when I was a young adult and I should have already known better. But the, those those tend to resonate with me. Anything that name drops my uh, my whole neighborhood, my my milieu, I'm very partial to those. And uh, I guess I think I have. Adam Schlesinger to thank for those. We talked about this in the last podcast, but it bears repeating that they drop, they name drop places in songwriting quote experts tell you not to name drop places because it makes your song is not universal and whatever. I'm in Ohio one. I've never been to any of these places. None of those places in the laser show even sound like real places to me. And I love that song. I mostly love it because they name drop all of Metallica, except for now that, now that, you know, um, Chase is not in the band, they got to like, I mean, they're not a band anymore, so Fountain Wayne can't change it. But if they played live, I feel like they would change it to adapt it to the actual band. But it's nice to know that those are actual real cities that they talk about. And it's also there. there's a com- total universality to being behind the wheel and having existential thoughts in a traffic jam or being on a train. You know, Amtrak is goes across the country. So a seller barely here. Not on, the, <laughs> not on this album, but but like we we have all been in those liminal spaces on planes, trains, and automobiles. And having that be a location in which we contemplate all the problems in our lives and what we can or cannot do to solve them. So whether it's the tap and Z or taking the LIE, um, you 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 can you can insert your your own interstate or parkway of choice. Yeah, it's like like for example in like Red Dragon Tattoo, like 
Uh, while I'm not used to going to Coney Island and I'm not used to the geography of that song and taking the train, which trains don't exist in the Midwest, um, <laughs> but, uh, but you, know, you know, I'm not used to all that. I can relate to, man, I'm just going to get absolutely trashed and do this thing to impress this girl I like. That, that's what the song is, right? But it's filled with the imagery of that specific geographical location. And I, I think that piece of advice, Mike, is kind of odd, personally, because the, the don't do locations in your... Because, like, I, I don't know. To me, that adds actually more life to it a lot of the time. You're getting told about these different places. You're getting, like, you're getting imagery. You're getting a, a feel for it. And it just, it's one of those things about art that kind of, expands where you can go, right? I, I really like that about their music, that it's often hyper-local because they're always conveying big ideas that everyone can relate to, to their geographic location. So good. I mean, the songs themselves are so good from, from a, you know, hooky earworm. I can mm -hmm. hum along to this. I'm going to, you know, bop my head in the car to this. The, the thing that makes a song relatable is if you like it enough, you will, by virtue of your own affection for it, find a way to project something about yourself into it, regardless of how local it is. That, you know, just deep gut visceral affection for something, if, if it sounds good to your ear and, and it moves you, you will transpose even the most arcane or hyper-specific lyrical content into something that applies to you personally. And I say this as someone who, you know, 90% of the power pop that I adore is written by men about women from a perspective that in my day-to-day -day life, I absolutely could not relate to at all. But within the context of listening to it, while I have my headphones on, or while it's on in the car, I I find it absolutely, you know, personally relatable in some way, even if it's just this kind of emotional abstraction. Um, it's there. As long as the melody is there, you'll find a way. Brandon, your favorite lyric on the record? I mean, I, I wonder if I'm going to steal yours. I feel like we think alike in a lot of respects here. You Mike. probably will if it's the one you talked about when we were not recording. Yeah, yet. so you know what? I'm going to go a different direction because I want that one to get – I don't want to double up on that one. I'm going to I'm gonna just – I think Red Dragon Tattoo is a delight. I've obviously talked about it like three times already. And it's a very simple line, but um, the, in you I can find Red Dragon Tattoo. I'm fit to be dyed and I'm fit to have you. That's such a just beautiful – just, just beautiful lyric writing. Fit to be tied. <laughs> Ingenious play on a cliche. Wait a Absolutely. It. I'm fit to be tied and I'm fit to have you. And, and the delusion of it, I think I love too, that it's so clear from the jump that this person has literally no interest. Maybe doesn't even know this person exists, right? Um, but this delusion that, well, I'm fit to get this tattoo and then that'll be the thing that does it, right? <laughs> that delusion of just being younger and being uh, really into someone. And I, I, I take a lot, I like about everything about that song in particular, but that line to me is just, in a way it kind of sums up everything they do. It's just a really simple, poetic and, uh, and catchy and melodic. Two takeaways from that song first, I never knew what Basil Hayden was until I heard this song. I didn't either. Me neither. <laughs> and now either. It's, it's kind of a joke with my wife and I. If we're ever at a bar, anyone ever orders it, we can't like not sing the couplet. Trim down on a Basil Hayden, get kicked out. Wait, right. Um, and also, you made a point about how the woman that he's getting the tutu form for doesn't know he exists the bridge really shows that by the way expert bridge writers collingwood and, and schlesinger the best i will gonna, use yeah will you stop pretending best. i've never been born now i look a little more like that guy from corn silly okay. but get the point across right oh, it's, it's so good <laughs> they made me and because i'm a songwriter i do stuff as as you are mike and um and, and you are as well Marissa, right 
No, I'm not. I am married okay. to one. She talks like one. <laughs> okay, you do talk like yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry about that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is one of those things where I love being reminded. Oh, you can be funny in songs. It's not against the law. Um, and I feel like that's really gotten phased out of rock music when it had been a part of it almost its whole history until more recently. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah there, but, but I love a, that about that. And especially in the '90s, you know, there was so much. It's just almost painfully sincere and uh, occasionally eye roll inducing navel gazing. <laughs> so you've got, yeah, they're, they're really in so many ways, just antithetical to the spirit of those times. And I feel like that's the reason why, you know, I was myself browsing uh, some of the reviews that came out when it was actually released and seeing stuff that su was suggesting that it, it was um, superficial or, shallow. Uh, and, and I think to myself, like, I, I feel like these reviewers are not listening to the same album that I'm listening to when I read they, stuff. They're like, like not paying attention. Yeah. Well, it's also now we have the benefit of 23 years of hindsight or whatever it's been. And it, the band has enough of a legacy and the songwriters have enough, uh, you know, industry cred that that appraisal it is, is self-evidently stupid but at the time it's it's almost like the the willingness to meet the record or the band where it was it just yeah. it was not there and i feel like music criticism at the time everybody needed uh every record to be yankee hotel foxtrot and that's just <laughs> not what a lot of artists did, you know, and I love Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, but um, I, I feel like they, at the time of this really self-serious, really experimental, look, they're a look, you know, uh, Utopia Parkway was what, a year before Kid A, maybe? Uh, 99, had... so a couple of years before Kid A. Okay, yeah, that's right. It was a couple of years. So it was more in the OK Computer era, at least. But still, bands were starting to do this, like, well, yeah, we're a rock band, but we're also artists with a capital A, you know? That was starting to become a thing, I feel like, in the late 90s. And Fountains of Wayne was just like, ah, we like writing melodic fun songs that are well-written. That's what we do. Of course, and and, I think a lot the, of the irony is that they're just as competent artists in a, using a different set of paints. Absolutely. I agree completely. So to reference the, the song that Marissa took her favorite lyric from, there's a lyric there, um, and I feel like that goes along with with Brand's discussion about fun. Sha -la 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 <laughs> is a totally yeah. repeating lyric in Denise, and it works. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Denise is. I mean, it's like a. It's like very close to a doo-wop chorus, uh, it, which is great with these amazing, you know, huge power chords happening in the background. It's just great. And that was one of the first songs when I was doing my little uh, listen through uh, after Schlesinger passed. And I was like, I need to give these guys for the, that was one of the things that caught me. It's like, oh, they're like, just, these are guys who love 60s pop music and are obviously into the 90s. Exactly. And that, that kind of music speaks to me as well a lot. So I was like, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> and then I went through each album after that. But, uh, yeah. So I thank you, Brandon, for, for mentioning my favorite lyric on this record offline and then letting me talk about it while I'm actually recording. And it's obviously from a fine day for a parade. Uh, Clears up her head with bourbon Cause beer is so suburban And day class say for what it's worth First of all, I speak French and I'm a Francophile And anyone that breaks out French in the song is like Okay now um, But what a way to describe it We talked about the character from this song earlier Right? Also, what this... is bourbon with suburban Is like song Genius. Of beauty, you know? That's great but also is loyal to the character, right? This is clearly a, a very old, set in her ways, conservative person who is afraid of new things and different ways of thinking and is afraid for her children and her life and her neighborhood. And, you know, beer is for the common man. I can't drink that because I am right. classy. So I need to drink bourbon when I need to get drunk. And just clears her head with bourbon. The You, you know that this is her own 
self delusion, right? This, this is what she tells herself. She, I don't have a problem. This is what I do to, to get my head straight, you know, after a, a long day of hand wringing about the state of this nation and my town and where it's going. It's brilliant. And I know, I, you know, I asked for just one lyric. There's so much good stuff on this record that we didn't even get to. Um, like a question. Why wasn't prom theme like the prom song for the entire nation for like five years? Because it's perfect. Well, maybe it had competition. When did that song Graduation by Vitamin C come out? I've was never that, heard like... of that song, but clearly I'm old. <laughs> Because that was the big one when I was uh, when I was in high school. What year? What year is your senior year, Marissa? I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry. Oh my goodness. Uh, 2006. All right. So this record came out in '99. So this is this will be before you. And after yes. me, I graduated in '96. But yeah. like the lyrics to prom theme, first of all, it's a slow song. It lends itself. They were clearly being intentional with what they wanted to say. And maybe the lyrics are a little too spot on. They talk about moving on and forgetting everybody's names and and how this is it's like a, the it's a little too perhaps uh cynical. It's maudlin though. Cynicism. I love it. It's cynical yeah. but also maudlin <laughs> and a little sweet. And here's the thing that makes it work. It's a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautifully written ballad. Yeah. The, the, and I think the cynicism for me actually cuts the, uh, if there is a corny component to it, which to me, prom night, a lot of it needs to be corny. You need, a, I mean, that sentiment in general, I think is inherently corny, but it's still a beautiful thing to explore. But when you get to the lyric and soon we'll say goodbye, then we'll work until we die. Like, then you're kind of brought back to like, oh, right. Well, yeah, yeah, they're not wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, it, or even just the, even if it's not work immediately, you're, you're just thrust into that other part of your life that never really goes away or dissolves. You know, it, it stays pretty, pretty uh, through and through at that point, but yeah, I agree. It's an absolutely gorgeous song, and I love those little lines that kind of bring you back to, like, this is what keeps it from being a song in Greece, right? Are these, like, uh, yeah, are these lyrics about mortality? <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't know that Greece would have a lyric about air guitars. Maybe not. I, I could see Danny Zuko playing in it. Having never seen Greece, I, I admit I'm not an authority on that. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Do either of you yeah, have a? Not missing a lot. I'm. I'm sure I'm not. Do either of you have a least favorite song on this record? I think this is different than the first one because Marissa. Remember, we talked about from the first record. Is there anything that didn't age well? I don't think there's anything here that didn't necessarily age super well. But is there anything here that's a least favorite for you? I hate to say, as far as the aging things, their videos age way worse than their songs. <laughs> I don't, there's a lot of videos that have aged age 12. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe not a lot. I don't know. I'm thinking of the song that must not be named clearly. Uh, that... Oh, you're, you're muted, Mike. <laughs> Man, I am like giving the boomer vibes and I'm Generation X. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you can do about, about aging videos because fashion oh, you can't. And, and that kind of thing. I, and I don't hold that, that against them or anything, but I, I think most of their songs for the most part have aged pretty well because they're just kind of introspective guys kind of, I don't know, relaying their, whatever their emotions or their opinions on the world. And I think they do a really good job of writing from a character perspective uh, so that, you know, what, what they're relaying is coming from a character. It's not specifically coming from them most of the time, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, I, I agree. It, it, it's very hard for me to pinpoint anything that hasn't aged well on this album, because n not only have the, are the, the component parts are timeless, right? The, this is, this is a classic pop rock songwriting. Um, to the extent that you are a, somebody like us, that, that stuff just is, it never gets old. It's classic. 
Um, and the lyrical content has only gotten more relevant to my mind because in personally in 1999, the world was shining and beautiful and full of promise and, uh, you know, life was good, right? Uh, Except for now, that whole year 2000 bug that was going to destroy civilization. Right. Or, you know, like the, the world changed so dramatically just a, a couple of years after this record was released. And now as a, you know, an elder millennial, geriatric millennial, whatever you want to call me, um, the that that sense of... I'm going to work till I'm dead or uh, I'm, I'm don't know what the hell I'm going to do with my office drone commuter life to be existentially fulfilled as opposed to just, you know, making ends meet, working, living paycheck to paycheck. That has just become so much more salient in 2022. And I'm not trying to be depressing. It's, it's just like that. Yeah. there's a realism to it. That's so relatable in this day and age. And the great thing about Fountains of Wayne is that they can sing about that sort of stuff and never sugarcoat it. But at the same time, it never leaves you with a bitter taste in your mouth. There's something like cathartic about it and comforting about it, despite its frankness. So I don't think any of us have a least favorite song on this record, do we? Do you? Do either of you have a, a song Gosh. on this record that you're like, I could leave it? No, there's only ever songs that I just like don't listen to as frequently as the other. You know, I I, yeah. I have now I want to know which one that is, or which <laughs> well, two have, that is. Yeah, um, I have two modes of listening to to albums, and one is I listen to the album start to finish, and I don't skip bless any you. <laughs> and the other is you know I'm revisiting my my favorite cuts, uh, because you know I only have 34 minutes on my express train, and I and I want to listen to you know, the stuff that I want to listen to. I, I guess in terms of these songs that I just, it hat and feet as amusing as it is, just, or, or dark as it is, as, as, as we uh, mentioned earlier, we can't really reach a consensus on that one. Um, it, it's a, a, f a cute little ditty, but, it, but it's not something that I'm going to go out of my way to listen to. Um, oh, even if you really want to hear some falsetto harmonies? <laughs> well, I, it it it, and I guess the senator's daughter. I just don't. Oh, dude, I love that song so. It's much. a it's it's a great song, but it it I just don't revisit it as frequently as the others, and that's almost incidental in a way. Subdued that one is. Yeah, and I'm I'm very much a, a um. It's got to be above a certain beats per minute, or I sort of I, check out. Kind of like I, I'm a simpleton. I fully yeah. talk to that. I'm with you. I think I think the back half of this record offers really good things, but not the kind of instant dopamine kick that the first half of this record offers, if that makes sense. Exactly. So so a lot of the time I'm listening to tracks one through eight, because those to me, for whatever reason, just have this perfect flow, perfect cadence. And each song is like getting it done from a melody and a, and a hook standpoint. The, the back half of the album is very good. I think it's a little, it's a little more of a, I hate to use the term, I mean, later show. It's obviously like, it's like an early Beatles thing, right? Like that, and they're clearly I'm... trying to be funny with that. Exactly. But exactly. they're also like, they're talking about going to the rock and roll show. I mean, they describe, they hide it in right. other terms, but right. don't we all relate to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I would I would say that I the first half of this record gets uh, pretty frequent rotation from me. Um, the full record less so, but I still really like it all. I can't really point out a least favorite. I do have a least favorite. That said, I don't skip it because I don't think anything on this record is bad enough to need to be skipped. Yeah. As an old dude, I listen to records straight through. Sorry, young folks. That's that's me. Um, that's Emily fair. Gardens is the one that I think is the low point of the record. And for a band like Fallon to Wayne, like uh, the low point is higher than a lot of bands' high points. But that song right. is challenging from a songwriting perspective and from an arrangement perspective. The chorus doesn't lift the way that typical choruses do. <laughs> I think that's a song that demands a certain amount of attention to really get. And it's sitting there at track nine. So right. unless you're like really in the mood to sit there and 
do the album listening thing. That one might not get as much of your as the attention of the regular listener as as most of the songs do. And it's got a nice upbeat BPM that would satisfy Marissa, I think. But the song itself is not nearly as it doesn't hit you in the face like like Laser Show or Lost in Space does, which Lost in Space. We haven't mentioned that song on this on this chat. What a great song that is. It's um mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. There there are quite a few references to star systems and outer space in general. Like like Fountains of Wayne are, are, are big on uh the space cadet theme. Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder why that is. I maybe someday we'll we'll be able to meet Chris and ask him why that is. Uh by the way, as an old dude, I kinda miss when when records had I'm holding now. This is not a visual podcast, so people who are not Marissa and Brandon <laughs> can see this. But I'm holding the the booklet that comes with the record, mm-hmm. and there's a very beautiful peep, picture of the dudes in the band looking really young because this was over twenty twenty four years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the lyrics are here, and there's cool art and. This is what I was getting when I bought music as a young person, and I mm-hmm. really feel bad that people today don't get that experience that often yeah, you, or you, don't want it. something about having that full tactile and aesthetic guide to um, investing in an album and in the world that it's creating. And things are becoming progressively more atomized uh, from in every dimension, you know, how we move about in the world and how we consume art and relate to art. So I do, I do miss it very much. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's informative it, beyond just being, you know, a, a fun thing to hold in your hand and to look at it. It tells you something about how it wants you to be engaged with. I think we have managed to mention at least once every song on this record, record, which is really what I was after. I think they're all good. I think that even though it came out in the 90s, it's worth visiting. Thank you, um, Marissa and Brianna, for talking about it. Of course. Where does this rank? Last question. Where does this rank on your personal rankings of favorite Fountains of Wayne records? Brandon first. first. (laughs) Oh, Marissa says Brandon first. Okay, Brandon first. Oh. This is the hardest thing you've ever made us do, Mike, is to rank Fountains of Wayne albums. This is pretty tough. (laughs) Um, It's not last, right? That should at least make it, or maybe it is last. Not last for either of you? No, it can't be last because last has to be like, I don't know, traffic and other out of state I was going to say out of state even, plates but yeah you even guys, though I guys, listen to it more it's probably it's probably too late to fully uh, get into this but you guys will hate me if you know what if you knew what my last was it better not be found to Wayne it oh is. it is oh no all right that's another podcast no, that's I my, that is another podcast that's my first and by the way but I'm old like so picking, this is like picking your least favorite out of all of your favorite things. So, like, I don't. There's literally no like uh, shot. Your least at the first favorite record. puppy that you right exactly. Well, I'm, I'm not a dog person, so that's not a good analogy. For me. <laughs> I love all of them, but I think this would be. I think the third to last, and it's close. I think the two that go behind it. Well, are we counting out of state plates? This is where it gets complicated. I mean, Marissa wants to count it, so we'll count it. Okay. Then it's, I, I think behind it are out of state plates, traffic and weather, and the first record. So I guess it's the fourth, the last. Okay. That means third. All right, Marissa. Yeah. For me, the self titled first album, Welcome Interstate Managers, and Sky Full of Holes all. Uh, supersede it. So I guess for me, Fourth. that, yeah. Now, for me, it depends on what day you ask. Today is tied for second with uh, wow. Welcome Interstate Managers. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put a second ahead of Welcome Interstate Managers, and I'll tell you why. There are a couple of songs that Welcome Interstate Managers that I don't think are as good as the weakest song on this record. All right. 
That's fair. Um, and I'm probably the only person that thinks that. Uh, and there's just certain, there's just special emotions in my heart for that first record because I discovered it before anyone knew who this band was. And I saw them on tour before anyone knew who this band was. And uh-huh. they were what I wanted to hear before I knew I wanted to hear this. And they just got better and better as time went on. Like, I mean, imagine just close your eyes and imagine being teenage or late teenage me discovering their first record for the first time when nobody else was sounded like that. And then now imagine that that's the band that you discovered. None of your friends like them and they keep putting out records, right? I mean, you're going to compare everything else that comes with it to the first record. Now the rest of them are all much better produced because they had more money. But man, that first record was always going to have a special place in, in my heart. And if you don't understand that, Brandon, um, I encourage you to go listen to the podcast that Marissa and I did about it. Um, so we have, less than, we have less than a minute. Doom's going to kill us. Uh, so let's wrap it up. Thank you, Bucks and Brandon, for doing this. Can I count on you to come back when we get around? Like, you know, the next record in, in the theme, oh, in the, in the line yeah. is we Welcome can do Interstate Managers, right? We can go tomorrow. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Do we do Welcome Interstate Managers first or Out of State Plays first? That's the question. Welcome Interstate Managers. Yeah, yeah, all right. I agree. So you're right, in. Who's going to make us all hat and feet? You're in. You're in for that <laughs> conversation, right? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Everybody have a lovely evening. So first of all, I have to thank Brandon and Bucks for their enthusiasm and taking the time to break down Utopia Parkway with me. Uh, I think we're going to have fun doing the next one whenever we get to it. Also, thank you, dear listener, for listening. You can probably tell from my enthusiasm about this album that I happen to love this band. They're a very strong influence on, on my songwriting. In fact, if it wasn't for them, uh, I think the music that I released would probably sound really different. Again, thank you for being with me, and have a lovely weekend.